Uh, so it is, it is very much my pleasure to introduce Yvette Gellis. Yvette is uh, in Los Angeles. She lives and works in LA. Um, she got her MFA in 2008 from Claremont Graduate University. She was born and raised in the Chicago area and the vast open terrain in contrast to the urban sprawl set up structures for her painting that echo or reiterate the impermanent and mutable states depicted in her work. Or put another way, her painting is not simply static, an illusion or picture of an event, but allows for participation in the event itself. Uh, and I can personally attest to this. I've, I've been lucky enough to see lots of Yvette's work and it does invite you in, um, sometimes very physically. She also works with installations where you feel like you are walking inside of a painting, which is a unique and exciting experience. We are also very lucky to have Yvette teaching at Pepperdine University. I'm sure some of you have had her in class. Uh, she is a gem of a teacher um, and we're just thrilled that, that she is uh, with us at Pepperdine. Uh, I am also just so thankful that she is here I'm going to talk about her art because she's an amazing artist and she is also an amazing friend. I'm very lucky to count her as a close friend. She is uh, as generous um, in her painting as she is in real life. She is just an amazing human, uh, inspiring, and I'm very excited for you all to hear her talk about her work. So Yvette, take it away. <laughs> Well, I'm glad this isn't a eulogy, but I've already invited you to give it. <laughs> and that's actually true. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Ty, it's my real privilege and honor to be here, to be your friend and to be your professor and to be a member of the Pepperdine community. Um, I think it's a, a really real blessing and beautiful place to have the honor to teach. So on that note, I wanna thank you all for being here today. And I will start to share my desktop with you and we'll get started. So I wanted to try something a little bit different today, which I haven't done. And I think because, because I'm also your professor and uh, I teach at Pepperdine, I wanted to talk a little bit about my journey where I started because I know what it's like right now to be in college and wondering what am I going to do with my life? And if you're an artist, how am I going to make a living? What kind of jobs are available for me and what can that mean? And, and it is a journey and I'm gonna take you a little bit through it. So what you're looking at, at least my journey, um, what you're looking at here is a picture of my mother. My mother was an artist and an art teacher, and this was taken about two years ago. We went to the uh, Art Institute of Chicago. This is where this is. Um, I grew up in Chicago, as Ty mentioned, and Professor Pone mentioned, and my mother took me almost weekly, if not monthly, to the Art Institute of Chicago. It was where I grew up. And my favorite painting, without a doubt, was always this big painting in the main gallery. And so when I was a kid, you'd walk in the front steps. Now they, you know, it's been redone for years and it's expanded. But we used to walk past those giant, lions on the end and up the big staircase and up, up, up. And the first room you'd get to was this with the painting by Caibot and it is rainy day Paris. So every, I don't think this painting has ever left the museum. And if it has, I don't know, it was always there whenever we were there. And so if you look at this picture, it sets up really everything I wanna talk about because I didn't understand my life truly and my work until a few years ago 
when my mother and I went back and she was in a wheelchair and I pushed her in front of the painting and walked back and took her picture. From this angle, if you look at it, she could roll right into the sidewalk, right? In fact, those people will have to step out of the way to make room for my mother, right? And if you look at this painting, sorry, let's still stay here. The streets are, are shiny and there's this ordinary day in Paris. There's nothing glorified about it. There's no set up drama where everything is posed or the people are looking at you. Even though this was part of the, the Impressionist period, it was a little bit different in that it was more compositionally and the, the perspective, the paint was not quite as loose as some of the other painters, except when you get into the, the atmospheric feeling in the painting. But what happened to me is what I wanted to talk about, is that I realized that all my life, all I wanted to do was get inside the painting. I wanted to walk in the painting. I didn't just want to be a spectator, because if you look at this painting and turn your head away and then go back, it's as if everyone in the background would actually take a step forward or move. And so I had the feeling that I was going to walk into the art and the art I loved were, were the, the, the works that made me feel a part of it, where my imagination could go, where I could become a different soul moving in and out of different worlds and different places. So how do you start here as a young girl and end up here? or end up here. Now these are all installations of mine. Or end up here. Or end up here. This is another version. This is France, by the way. Or here, where the paintings are trying to move into the space. Or something like this. This is outside my studio at the 18th Street Art Center or something like this. How do you go from this to this? Where my paintings, this was a 45 foot mural that was hung outside 18th Street Art Center. And it was a, uh, a joint project with a Korean artist who put my paintings into his work and then I worked on top of it with house paint. Or how do you go from this painting into this painting. This is um, Joshua Tree, actually Yucca Valley, or into this where the light and the paint is merging with the environment. And as the light changes and the environment changes, so does the work. Or how do you go from something like this where the work is moving, a painting is moving into space and then eventually becomes this. Or how do you take a painting like this and move it into space? How do you go from this painting to this painting? Notice I'm moving, I'm still trying to walk into a painting all my life. Can you imagine that I didn't even get it until a few years ago? Like, wow, light bulb, look at that. You know, the, my favorite painting I keep visiting over and over and over again is still informing my process. How can I walk into an abstract painting? How can I merge imagery with abstraction and move into space? How? How can I take paintings, hang them on walls and move them into the space so that you can walk into the painting? And that's what I'm doing. 
I'm walking up the stairs. This was for a show called Walls, which was at the produce market downtown LA. Um, again, materiality, whatever it takes, whatever I can combine, whatever means I can find, however I can throw things together, whether abstracted or not, how can I merge myself into painting without losing the painting? So there's so many great space and light artists that I love, but they gave up the mark. They gave up the hand, the paint. I am determined that I won't. <laughs> so here's one of my last, and this is the Annenberg. This is mounted actually just this last few days, um, or a week ago, almost a week ago. So um, how do you go from this to this? And that is what I'm going to try to talk about today. Um, I will show you some of the paintings later. So let's move forward. <clears throat> I'm now going to show you a little bit of my very early work that addresses some of those, some of those questions you may have about what am I going to do? So when I finished my undergraduate, <clears throat> I was making work kind of like this, right? Women. I had a lot of life drawing. And I was thrown into the commercial arena. And this is the kind of work I started to do. So first I worked for the Chicago Tribune newspaper. Then I got a job with a big art studio in Chicago. And I, I was determined to earn a living as an artist. So I worked harder after I got out of college than I did while I was in college because I had to learn how to airbrush and I worked with artists that knew and had skills that I didn't have. I started getting jobs like this, and this is before, okay, so the computer's out, but we weren't using the computer like you can today. I didn't have the opportunity to Photoshop in logos and all this stuff. I had to find a way to draw all of that in and make it look three-dimensional. So all of this line work, all of the little, you know, airbrushed things and all of this, I was paid, right, to put the ad together. And it ran in the newspaper. So I did a lot of work like this. And believe me, I never did anything like that in college. <laughs> so my education really came afterwards. I'm sorry about the focus on this. Um, I learned how to airbrush. This was for the National Beef Council, right? Lots of taping. This ran in the, uh, it, what was the name of that newspaper? Um, in Chicago. <clears throat> and this, you know, it, it was an, a big ad and a big, took over half the newspaper. So here you have this idea. Somebody hands you an idea and you conceive that idea, you develop it. So I became a commercial artist, right? And I started doing anything I could, trying to find who I was. So I would take little jobs as an illustrator and I did little bits in magazines and I had this kind of fun style going. And then I went to France and I got a job with this avant-garde magazine and they loved me because now I knew how to do, use an airbrush, right? So here I am single in Paris, right? Living in a little flat and I'm making this wild art and it's going on the cover of all these magazines all over Europe. How much fun was that, right? And some of them were really crazy fun, right? And so I was painting the face of who the avant-garde woman was. And there was an English version and a French German and an 
version and a Danish version. So I all I did was sit around and make these fun covers and go out at night and sit at cafes and talk about art. And it was fun, okay? But I had developed already these skills. So then I came home, I couldn't stay there, right? So what did I do when I got back? I took any kind of job I could. These were paintings I was commissioned to do. And at this point, I was starting to feel like I could paint anything, right? But who was I? What kind of an artist am I? So these were, then these are gouache, watercolors, landscapes. And then something happened. And this is a pretty large painting. All my commercial artist friends said to me, you're not a commercial artist, you're a fine artist. And I knew it. So when someone gave me a job to paint a hamburger, I'm a vegetarian. So I couldn't make it look good. I couldn't paint a hamburger, so you'd wanna take a bite out of it. But there were lots of people who knew how to do that better than I could. But I could do this right? I could throw the paint around. So I started to do that. But something happened again. I realized I wanted to break it down and get to the essence of what a horse is. So the horse started to break apart and break apart until I ended up with this. I abstracted it, but you can still see the horse in the painting. And then the same thing happened with a figure. I had a figure and the figure broke apart. And I was trying to figure out how to get inside the figure. At one point I photographed the paintings outside as part of the, the actual uh, landscape. Now I got into art center at this point. I was commissioned to do this. This was a 14 foot painting, but, but it was a commission. So then I wanted to break it apart. So I needed that freedom to get to the essence of what it is, right? So I did this painting and then I did this painting and these are all this painting, right? I did this version and I thought, okay, I'm getting somewhere. And then I did this painting and I thought, I'm getting somewhere. And then I did this painting. I said, ah, okay. Now I'm getting what it is I'm trying to say. And that's when <clears throat> I had to take a break from Art Center because of my kids. <laughs> and I started teaching. And I started teaching. And then I got into Claremont when I knew my kids could like function without me driving them everywhere. <laughs> So then I got into graduate school. Now I'm at Claremont Graduate University and I don't know what I'm gonna do. All I know is I wanna break up and discover you know, how to get inside a painting. And notice these paintings. These are my first works that I was doing in my studio. They're puzzles. Like I'm looking for the puzzle piece that will make sense to me. This was the first show that we had which really accomplished something that I was trying to get. Space, that the abstract mark was a thing and it functioned as an object and I could move it around in and out of space so that it had depth and it had meaning and it wasn't just moving paint around, it was the essence of an idea that I was reaching for, but look, I'm trying to get inside. It's not that dissimilar from this painting and trying to roll my mother right into the street of Paris. But I developed that work further and further. And then it became pure abstraction. But still, I called this bridges. Still, I'm moving in and out of space and I'm pushing it. But it's like, okay, I got that. Everyone's excited about it. 
But I knew I wasn't excited about it because I wasn't getting where I wanted yet. So then I took over the atrium and I started painting and trying to figure out what is it? What is it? How can painting move into space? How can painting... And, and actually, I think this is also house paint. So now if you look at this, now I'm engaging with different materials tape, you know, wallpaper, boxes, trying out different things and realizing I'm getting somewhere, but not yet. So then, okay, I break up that painting, I cut it up into pieces and I refigure the idea thinking, okay, I'm gonna move it now into the space. I'm gonna get somewhere now, I know I will. And then here I am. <laughs> Do I sound like I'm a kid? <laughs> I, I guess I've never stopped being a kid, right? So I'm like really playful, you know, but I'm seriously playing. So I'm cutting up that big, huge installation. And, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, kind of getting there, right? I'm kind of getting there, but not yet. So I go back to the atrium and I take those pieces and I refigure it into these pieces. And now I'm thinking, okay, I got it. I got it now, but not quite, almost. <laughs> so you see this kind of unrest that you have to learn to live with, this never perfect satisfaction. And as long as you understand that you have to live with that, then you're okay. Then you're not going to kill yourself over the fact that you haven't gotten what it is you want. And you just try to be playful with the journey. So then I realized, oh, I get what I'm doing. I make an installation. Then I make a painting about the installation. So then I made the paintings. Now notice more finding more materials, more combining ideas starting to take more photography, trying out different materials, and then trying out different surfaces. Now I'm playing with uh, like a glaze coat resin in here on a hard panel. And that was working really well for me for a while. This painting was included in the Claremont, uh, Claremont um, I'm talking so much I can't even say the name of my own university. <laughs> I'm so in the painting that I can't talk. Um, so uh, the Claremont collection. So it comes out really like six or seven inches out from the actual painting. And then I tried different things. This was a summer show I did. Size, yes, that's me. And little, little paintings to big giant paintings, to again, these ideas, combining with some of my photography and then throwing the paint around out of frustration. Something's happening here, or is it, <laughs> right? So this is really where the materiality is really working for me really well. The empty spaces working into the physicality on the canvas. So now my paintings are getting really physical with materiality as the presence and the hand of the artist is there. So a, a roadmap, if you will, or a mind map of my thinking. So this is kind of where I ended um, toward the end of my time at Claremont. And then let's look at my thesis show a little bit. So we're going to come over to book. Okay, and let's enlarge this. I thought that would enlarge it. I think we have to wait a minute. Okay, so <clears throat> this is how I ended graduate school and this is where most artists start their artist talks, okay? <laughs> 
And so the best part of my talk just happened. <laughs> um, five large panels. And what I did is that what you don't see are walls and there's a floor piece, which is, you know, about the same size as this painted mark that's over in this area. And what I basically did was block out the gallery space and redraw it and included, if you remember that painting I showed you, that was on one of the walls. I painted some of the paintings in to the walls so that the paint was on the walls in the paintings, but coming off into the space. Now, the idea of what is happening in the space is also happening in the paintings is a very interesting idea. Now, this book is a little long, so if you don't mind listening to the page turn, the pages turn, I'm not going to stop on everything I've already shown you, but I want to quickly go through some of it. So, um, and it's a little slow, so give it a give it a moment. Let's see what we have here. Okay, uh, some of my reviews. Okay, so now after graduate school, I have a studio at the 18th Street Art Center, which it, which I was awarded as um, you know right out of the the gate from Claremont, and I started making paintings kind of like this, right? I'm trying to understand painting. Now, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about a lot of this work and just go through some of it. These are dogs. And this was after I did a residency in Paris. They're dogs with um, uh, different um, activities and animals. This was the, a painting I did at the Torrance Art Museum. Again, um, look at, how come it's going big? Look at the um, image here on the left. This is the kind of sculptural piece that you're now seeing me make where I'm pouring polyurethane foam and trying to control its direction and how to put it together. And, um, and how to paint it. And so where the mark in the painting becomes the, and I'll use this because Professor Pownell's here, here, the sculptural piece on the floor. <laughs> it's not, I think of it as a three-dimensional painting, but it's a sculpture, right? So this is a, like a, four, you know, like a, a 13, it's nine feet tall by 13 feet long. And again, this is the painting and this is the size of the painting. And I'm painting this segment over here, if that makes sense, if you can see it. Okay, this, let's just keep moving. A lot of work I'm doing in Santa Monica, my residencies that I've spent in Arizona and the work that came from there. This is one of them. Peggy knows this one. <laughs> um, and then I curated an exhibi uh, exhibition called Pretty Vacant, where we took over a house in Westwood. And it was my first really big curatorial uh, project. We had, I think, 14 artists in it. And I took over this room and transformed it so that the room had, the architecture had to make room for the work and for the art. And it was really a successful showing. And it was up for about five or six months and we had every major museum there and it was really exciting. We got some really nice reviews. Um, so <clears throat> how does that happen? Again, here is another exhibition I did. Uh, these are the peepholes that I cut out out of wood. So before you walked into the exhibition, these are the different points of view that you could see. So that I called it, um, I think, what did I call this show? A Thousand Ways of Seeing, uh, right there. A Thousand Ways to See It. 
So from every point of view was a different painting. And you can see again, I'm playing with sculptural elements, different materials, anything and everything. I've now introduced plexiglass in a real way. I'm loving what I can do with it. Even the plexiglass pieces in the piece sold, it was funny. So these are some of the paintings that were actually in the show. Um, and separated out. And all of the paintings then went up to San Francisco to another exhibition. I just wanna make sure I get through this. Okay, we're good on time. Um, and uh, I'm just going to keep moving. This is work that I did when I was in um, Taiwan and Okay, so on my way to Taiwan, I was the last plane to arrive in Taipei because there was this typhoon coming in. And so if you look at the, the big paintings that I did and how they were structured, and I did this with Wang Ti Lin, who's a wonderful artist in Tainan in the south of ta Taiwan. So when I arrived, uh, the next day was a big national holiday because they closed down the country for the typhoon, except it just rained and then last minute it kind of blew aside. So it was pre, pre the, the typhoon, you know, before anything happened. And then it was, let's see, after the, during the typhoon and then after the typhoon. So I made all the work I did in Taiwan about the typhoon. And you can see how it's broken up here. We got some really nice press. These are some of the artists that I worked with. <clears throat> and then they all, all my Taiwanese artists came to um, LA and we mounted another exhibition. And this is the work that I did for that. Again, it was based on my experience in Taiwan, but notice, I'm still trying to figure out how to bring painting into the space. And still, I still don't know why, right? I still am just doing it. It's like following my intuition. So we call that round trip ticket. Then I went back to Taiwan to the, um, uh, and I mounted another exhibition. And this time, instead of moving into the, the space, I tried to move the panels forward so that you actually had to walk behind the paintings and that pieces of the, the painted plexi and the mylar were, were coming forward. So I'm trying to mess up with the directions a little bit of this. And this is at the, um, and the Taiwanese will say this better, Jiali at the, Solon Cultural Park and Museum. And that's right near uh, Taiwan. So now I'm in France doing this huge exhibition at a cathedral that's been gutted in villeneuve le grand in this little town. And uh, I have this huge space that I've been um, given to put on an exhibition. So I went to the space a year earlier and measured out the windows. And if you, you can see, I drew the windows actually in my studio and then slowly, slowly they became abstracted and moved down into space. And what was interesting and beautiful about this space were a few things. One is when I got there, I could do rubbings on the floor and the walls because this is a 14th century built, you know, structure with such an amazing history in it. And so I started all these rubbings, not only on the paper, but on the uh, on clear uh, mylar as well. I painted all of this letting the actual stone come through as a map and a tracing of what happened in that space. And so slowly it becomes more and more abstracted. But the history of women and the abuse of women through time somehow became the theme of the work. 
And so it wasn't far from where a lot of um, interesting historical things happened. So I really enjoyed that. One of my favorite things I've ever done. Um, let's give it a minute. It's supposed to turn. There we go. So, um, okay, great. So now I'm back in Yucca Valley and I mounted this piece, which I mentioned, I think I showed you some of the work before and I talked about it. Um, but one of the works that I've done that I really want to explore further outside working with plexi painting and using the natural light there's something extremely beautiful and sublime and spiritual about using a natural environment and the natural light, but still painting, still painting. So I think if I make any contribution, that was it. Then I moved to Vienna, um, uh, my work, and uh, this was work that left an exhibition. Now, what I did here was I took three paintings and designed this wallpaper. And then I cut the wallpaper up and put it inside the paintings, right? So it's in the paintings, it's on the wall, and then I painted the wall as well. And then uh, the work actually started in, um, in Linz. And you can see that I'm painting on the wall and working both wallpaper and the paint. So these are some of the images of that. These are the paintings that are printed into the uh, painting. Um, okay, I would like to move off of this. Then you can see the finished work. Um, let's go down here. And I'm going to move on to another show that I did actually with yours, um, your wonderful professor and someone we love very much. <laughs> professor Pondo, da -da, there you are on the right. Um, with his amazing work. So we did this really, how many years ago was this? Uh, seven, 2017, okay. Wow, time has gone by fast. Okay, so um, we had this really beautiful space downtown in the arts district and a really great gallery. Um, and Ty went down and made these amazing sculptures. But, but for me, what I saw in the work was this idea of merging into the work, right? It's, you know, and the circular, the circular idea of the, um, you know, it, it's like the spiritual eye, this penetration that you can go into. And for me, that was like, again, it's not out here, it's inside. It's this idea of getting interior. And that, you know, um, here I am trying to merge with painting, but at the same time, I'm now turning the telescope, if you will, inside. So I these are some of the works that I did. I know I showed you a few of these. Um, and this was a lot of fun to do. I started to, to saw my pieces that were sculptural in, in uh, in pieces as they were broken and they could move around a space um, and engage with the space as if you could merge with it. And this is some of Professor Pownell's work again. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> okay. You're gonna do your own artist talk. Nothing. You're you're doing great. It was a pleasure okay. to do the show with you. <laughs> Liminal space is what we call the show. It's that in-between space where you are moving from one thing to the next. And so liminal is a really beautiful um, 
adjective, would you call it? Um, but look at how exciting this was. I, I couldn't believe that that Professor Pownell came up with this kind of work against these paintings. I mean, it was just like some sort of divine intervention. It was really brilliant for, for me to have that opportunity. Again, here's the painting, trying to get into the painting and the conversation really, you know, so much to say about that, but I'm just showing you a few pieces of the work. Um, oftentimes, and I'm in, I showed this earlier on, this piece, I will take a painting that'll sit there for a, a while, even sometimes a few years, and then decide that it never achieved what I wanted it to achieve. And I'll work into it and find a way to, these are some of his works. Um, so let me get off of this one. And we're going to move on to my last show. Well, one of them here, this one. So I did, uh, I guess this was 2019. Was it 19? Yeah, at the end of 2019. So um, this was at CSUN. And this really represents a move for me in a different direction. And I will just quickly tell you the story. Um, and the, the rest of this goes pretty fast. Um, one day I was walking into my studio and there at my doorstep was this beautiful orange colored leaf. And it was at a time when there were no orange colored leaves, right? But this one was like it had just freshly fallen and was placed right at my doorstep. Now, my doorstep is outside. So I figured there's a tree somewhere with an orange leaf. So I wandered around, no orange leaves anywhere, up the street, down the street, around the center, up and down, no. So I decided this was a divine gesture. I picked it up and brought it in my studio and set it someplace very special. And it became like an altar like a, a, a connection to something beyond myself. And that, that one leaf became the many leaves, became the trees, the branches. It became all the trees around my studio and the root systems that went down and under the ground and around. And then before I knew it, it was all of LA and all moving through California across the United States, down under the ocean and all around. And I realized that one leaf connected all of us together as a human and universal soul of all human beings, all plants, all animals, all life. And it was such a profound experience that I started including leaves and everything, leaves going up to the heavens and every real leaf in the picture, they still come to me to this day. I still find them. One day I was sitting up at the um, memorial, the 9-11 memorial at Pepperdine, meditating on a, a bench and it had been swept clean, right? And all of a sudden I looked down and there was one leaf right next to me on the bench, right? So omnipresence or chance? Omnipresence or chance? Omnipresence or chance? Now, fortunately I kept the leaf and there it is, the original leaf, still with its color in the box. And so this became this crazy work of which I figured my career would be over in the art world <laughs> because no one would believe me. And then I thought, all I want to get to is the truth, right? And so that's what this became. There's the one leaf. Again, still working with plexi, installation, walking in and around the leaves. I painted the leaves. Then I went up to Antelope Valley 
and started photographing poppies, painting the poppies. All the big paintings became, here's the, the paintings. Some of them have original photography. All of this came, comes right out of my imagination. Um, this was the big wall that I, I painted with the sky. So I'm trying to include as much as I can about the work. So let's get off of that. And I'm going to end and I'll open it up for questions. Um, so how do I get to um, this, which is currently up right now, right? This is at the at I Beam Gallery. It's an online gallery. And these pieces, it's like a mock gallery. And I don't know if anybody's seen it online, but you can uh, just Google I Beam. And this artist, David D. Michelle, makes these amazing you know, installations with different artists' work. And they're miniature works. Like this is 20 inches for me. And so what fun to see still making these little sculptures. And this time I was able to put the mirrors in there so they could reflect the actual painting. So um, we had a lot of fun. It was online um, trying to talk about that work. So that's that. And now what I'd like to do is show you a couple little videos of my studio and of my current project right now. So these are brand new, they were just filmed and there's more coming. And then I'll show you the current installation at the Annenberg in a video. And then I'll open it up for questions and I will say just a couple things later. So let's see this and let's get this. Not that I want to see myself large. <laughs> okay. I'm Ethan Gellis and I'm a visual artist. And we're here today in my studio as I prepare uh, my um, Out of the Blue project for the Annenberg Beach House. <laughs> interested me most about art was that I could provide an experience where the viewer or the average pedestrian could walk into a painting or be a part of that work. Okay, that's one. <laughs> one down. Let's see, how do I get this? Where's that little um, let's do that. Gallus, okay. I'm a visual artist, and we're here. Today okay, so let's now look at the picture. second. Uh, my um, out of the blue. I'm part. trying to move on. Okay, so this is another very short clip. This, these are, by the way, just posted online the last week. Um, so I'm gonna. Again, in my studio, by the way, the paintings in the background are a body of work no one's seen yet. <laughs> boundaries of what painting could be and what it could do. Hmm. 
<laughs> okay, so now little, little bits. And I just want to play this for you. This is the walkthrough. Now, what I, all I wanted to say about this is, yes, it's landscape. But the idea for me, what happened is I walked into my studio after this last year. My mother passed away. We went through a world pandemic. We're still in it death around you, destruction, uh, political turmoil, on and on and on, we've all lived through it. And I walked in my studio one day and nothing I was doing felt relevant anymore. And I didn't know what to do. And I say that, you know, it's not that I've given up the idea of walking into a painting, but what happened was I wanted to be relevant and how are you relevant if you're not talking about what's going on around you, that you're not embracing who you love, what your politics are, what you think about, what you read, you know, um, what's your faith? You know, all these things are important. And I realized that I was actually more of a giver than I am a taker. And I didn't want it, I couldn't just have it be about me alone in the studio, my ideas, my, what I wanna do, me, me, me. It just didn't feel relevant. And so when I was asked to come up with an installation, they said they, they wanted peace and harmony. I thought, yes, that's what I could do. I could give that. I could give that to people. I know what to do. And I could still make it an experience where you have to merge into the painting, where it can be uplifting to the human spirit, where I could bring joy and positivity and love even to people today in such a, a period of time. And so risky, for me in my career, who cares? Because I want to be able to do that. And if I can, what is more important than that, right? So this is what I did. Now, by the way, I've been on location since these paintings are there and some of them have, have changed quite a bit. Um, so these are the panels that I worked on in the studio. And one more point, I painted them three times. I made the paintings, I had them photographed onto the um, printed on the vinyl to size per fence, because every fence was a different size. And then I had the panels back in the studio where I repainted them. And now I still have the option to paint on location, which I'm doing. Um, some of my own photography is in there, a few little bits from my daughter but mostly throwing the paint around and here it is. I think, real time.
Okay. <laughs> That's it. I'm stopping my desktop and I'm going to open up for discussion. <laughs> Let me see, we have something in the chat room here. It's like Bella, you raised your hand. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing. That was amazing. I feel like your work um, and your classes and just when you speak and teach in general is a very like spiritual experience. And it's also very philosophical, which like I, I appreciate um, your your trying to figure out how to bring painting into space and following intuition. Um, like merging the material and the spiritual, um, really interesting um, concepts. And I think um, it, grasps, it grasps at some, some ineffable truth. And like, I think that's what your work tries to do. I mean, all, I mean, you said in your, in your, with omnipresence and chance, all you wanna get to is the truth. And like, I just really appreciate your work for that. And I think it's, um, phenomenal in that way um i wonder um just your sharing like your your journey of like being a young artist and like how you evolved was like great to watch because it, it gives other people who are interested in viewing art like how did you do it what does it look like logistically um and it was really cool to see your graphic design um stuff uh, especially the avant-garde magazines those are super cool um <laughs> Along your journey, um, did you have have you encountered any like books or literature that like you find um, like helped you along your artistic journey and spiritual journey? And if so, what are those books? Um, <clears throat> yes, the the first one that comes to mind, I think it was required reading actually for my one of my classes was seeing is forgetting the thing of the name of the thing one sees. And that's the Robert Irwin book. And I recommend that because it's, it's, it's really fun to read it. Just what he was like and, and his journey, you know, how he made his paintings. And even though my work is quite different from his, I relate to him totally, like psychologically, what he went through and what he does. Like, how he walked into his studio one day and thought, man, now this is a bunch of crap, right? And I'm gonna start all over. You know, I get that and reaching for something more, you know, pushing. Um, I also really recommend spiritually, there's a book called, um, that has been, you know, really beautiful for me, which is um, um, Autobiography of a Yogi which is very universal, spiritual. And I think it's been on the top bestseller for 50 years of spiritual books. And, you know, as a Christian, you'll really love the journey because you understand, you know, that um, it's, it all comes down to, you know, love and wanting, wanting to know God, you know, what's, or asking the important questions in life, you know, what's the purpose of life, you know? <laughs> so that's a big question, right? <laughs> I don't know if that's enough. I'm not going to give you any more books. <laughs> those two, those two are great reads. Um, anybody else? Thank you, Bella. It's so beautiful to see you. We've got time for uh, a couple more questions, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, CJ. Hey. Hi there. Um, yeah, so I am really shocked and impressed. I shouldn't be impressed because you're a wonderful and great artist, um, but I really love the last videos that you showed us of your um, landscape work the very, along the sidewalk. Um, as I can tell, that probably took you many, many hours, um, probably many days worth of hours. Uh, yeah, so my question is just like, 
when you were doing this, I know that you love art. Obviously, you've kind of wrapped your entire life around art. Uh, so my question is, when doing this, do the hours seem like minutes? Um, did, did this time just fly by for you while you were doing that? You know, I had in the studio, the piles of those that I had to go through and about halfway through, I actually didn't have that much time to work on them because once they approved the printing, that took about a week and a half. And then I had less than two weeks to paint them all. Now, mind you, they were already printed with my paintings in them and they were designed so I knew what I wanted to do. But I remember one panel I spent five hours on and I looked at the pile of tubes there and I thought, my God, I'm never gonna get through if I spend that much time. And so I just had a lot of really late nights in the studio. I drank more coffee. I'd have three or four coffees before I left and I drank an entire pot when I was there. And I, I would come home like, you know, a crippled woman. <laughs> Honestly, if you look at the videos, I, I'm like cringing because I look so tired. In those. <laughs> um, but um, I paint fast and landscape painting is not hard for me. It's, it's, really, um, it's really fun. I, I think abstraction is more difficult, but I'm trying to rethink, you know, how to view, how to do landscape now. Um, and that's an interesting thing to take on, you know, how to move it off a of plein air, how to involve it in other ways. And that's, that's got me giddy with joy, actually. I felt that joy, it, you know, doing it. Even late, and I listened to lots of podcasts and lots of, you know, motivational talks and lots of music, different kinds of music and opera and jazz and you know, disco music and, you know, I kept changing the song so that when, as soon as I was really tired, I'd put on, you know, Donna Summers <laughs> and I'd be in there dancing, you know, trying to keep myself going so I didn't fall asleep. But um, yeah, I, it was really, I really loved pushing myself physically, you know, as hard as I could. That, that interests me, you know. That was interesting. So thanks, CJ, for the question. <laughs> By the way, I want to mention that Ryan is here today. Um, and Ryan, I don't know if you saw it. Were you in that video? Ryan uh, wanted to come out and help me. And he showed up. And he was there all afternoon helping mount those things. So. Ryan, really hats off to you, man. You were incredible. He came up with little special ways to put those zip ties in and yeah. So you guys all zoomed out. I've been talking so much. <laughs> no, no, that was amazing, Yvette. I was, um, uh, you, you kind of beat me too. I was gonna ask about this, kind of relationship you've had with interior spaces for so long and sort of painting interiors, painting, um, you know, sort of uh, private residential spaces. And now it, it really seems it's, it's last couple shows, it's been really exciting to see the, the landscape come into the work, maybe back into the work in a real large way. <laughs> uh, it seems like, you know, the, I've always thought of your, your foam sculptures as having so much to do with landscape. Um, I mean, of course, that's sort of my personal perspective and bias coming into it. But um, so it's, you know, it's, it, it's exciting to see you sort of bringing those, that imagery of, of mountains into the painting uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so thank you for, for talking a little bit about that. I won't make you talk about it. Yeah, anymore. thank you. Yeah, I, I'd actually really like to push that work. It's like, Sometimes, you know, this is where it, it really helps to be on a spiritual path because you have to listen to where the universe is trying to push and pull you. And 
why I was handed this job, you know? And the, the curator kept saying, I just love your work so much. But then she picked me to do all these landscapes, right? And I didn't have any of that on my website and none of that submitted. So, um, you know, I'm listening to that. What, what can I do with that? How can I make it bigger, you know, more, you know, how can I continue to try to get inside? you know, a painting. So that's kind of where I'm, my head's at right now. You know, I'm playing around with those ideas, but. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, oh, thank you. This is just amazing to hear you talk and the, the passion, you know, it's just, it, it oozes out uh, of, of your speaking and, and of your work uh, into the, into the physical space and it, it draws us into the into the imaginary space and the spiritual space and it's it's just very even on the screen it's very life-giving um and i the next uh the next show that you have in the area please tell all of us tell the world and you guys should all go out and go to the annenberg house and see the see the work on the on the sidewalk as i plan to do soon um, so thank you so much of that Thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful spring. Isn't today the first day of spring? April 21st, right? Or is it March? It's today, isn't it? Officially, April 21st? Yes, M March? Oh, okay, well, whatever. So enjoy your continuing your spring. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you so much for being here. And I love you all. I really love you all so much. So. Thank you.